Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, welcome. Um, good evening. Um, it's great to see people in this uh, lecture theatre. This is my first ever time at this po podium, so it's uh, an exciting moment for me. Um, welcome to the Geological Society's um, President's Public Lecture, uh, Joining the Dots, Climate Change, Mil Mineral Extraction and the Engineering Geologist. Um, I'm Simon Thompson. I'm the Chief Executive at the Geological Society, and I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce you to Ruth Allington, President of the Geological Society, who's giving today's lecture. Um, this uh, event is being streamed live. Um, for those of you who are joining remotely, uh, a brief beef bit of housekeeping. Um, throughout this lecture, your microphone will be muted and your video camera will be switched off, so you can slurp your coffee if you're watching this at home. Um, you, so you'll you'll only be able to hear and see the speakers. Um, for those of you who hear it here in person, if the fire alarm goes off, um, there are um, fire escapes at the back um, and one here, and we would congregate in the courtyard near the Society of Antiquaries. Um, uh, so. Ruth Allington is president of the Geological Society and has been active with the Society for just under 40 years. Um, she joined the engineering group uh, in 1981, serving as honorary secretary, vice chair and chair, and was awarded the Glossop Medal in 2012. She served on the editorial board of the Quarterly Journal of Engineering, Geology and Hydrology, Hydrogeology, sorry, and was member of the council uh, the Geological Society Council from 2000 to 2005, serving as vo both Vice President and Professional Secretary. For more than 10 years, she represented the Society on the Council of the EFG, the European Federation of Geologists, including four years as President. Ruth has been a consulting engineering geologist in the min minerals industry, and more recently, a professional mediator and expert witness. I'm now going to hand over to Ruth to deliver the lecture. Um, there'll be a 15 minute question and answer session at the end of Ruth's presentation. For those of you here in person, um, please just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. If you're online, uh, please submit your questions into the Q&A box function. Um, we might not be able to answer all the questions submitted, but we'll do our very best. Um, and now without further ado, over to Ruth. Good evening, everybody. It's really nice to be in our lecture theater with people in it. And it's really nice to know that there are also people, um, as they used to say, well, certainly my family, looking in at home. Um, so the energy transition, the transition to low carbon energy. This is a really essential response to climate change and achieving net zero or anything even approaching that. There are also huge challenges around responding to the impacts of climate change that is already taking place, that has already taken place. We're thinking about their adaptation, disaster recovery and mitigation. I want to talk to you this afternoon about what these challenges of our time mean for the production and supply of raw materials. The challenges of extracting and supplying raw materials responsibly and the roles of geoscientists in achieving responsible raw materials. Um, I am an engineering geologist, as, as, as Simon had said, has said. Um, I, a lot of what I say will be, will be fairly um, general, but it's, it, there will be a little bit of engineering geology, geology in there for those of you in the room. I know there's at least one person who is an engineering geologist. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the changing demand and supply landscape and highlight the links to these climate change related challenges. I'm then going to go on to look at sustainability and ESG and the way we seek to implement sustainable solutions. I want to talk also a bit more broadly about the people involved, especially geoscientists, and obviously from my point of view as an engineering geologist, how they contribute to bring about responsible mineral extraction and supply, and what can go wrong. And I particularly want to talk about what can go wrong so that we can, um, you know, it's useful to understand what, what goes wrong so that we can, we can fix it and, and try and do better next time. To illustrate my talk, I'm going to draw on my own experience. 
which is as an engineering geologist specializing in the design of open pits, especially quarries um, like uh, this one for the recovery of construction raw materials. That, that um, the quarry on my opening slide is a um, cement raw materials. Um, it's a limestone quarry for, for the supply of a, a cement, cement works with, with, um, with, uh, with, with limestone. The, the design of, a, of an open pit, a quarry or an open pit mine, needs to produce something that is safe, efficient and profitable. And it also needs to give rise to the minimum adverse impacts on the environment and people. I'm also going to draw on my dispute resolution experience a little bit. I love this cartoon that I first saw in a presentation given by Karen Hanghoy, who is director of the British Geological Survey. And she's very kindly allowed me to use some of her other slides that I, I was impressed with in this, in this talk. For me, it suggests a world in which our needs for safety, prosperity, green spaces, sustainable energy are met. And most particularly where these things are more equally available around the globe. Here you can see the wide range of mineral raw materials in familiar parts of our environment. These are things that we don't grow. These range from bricks made from clay, aggregate, stone and cement, to a huge number of metals, some of which I had never heard of when I was at university, and rare earths. They all come out of the earth. This slide neatly summarizes the range, I, I say neatly, not to be self-congratulatory because I've, I've borrowed it from Karen. This slide neatly summarizes the range of established and developing technologies um, that will play such important roles in the transition to a low carbon future. Not only is the supply of a wide range of earth materials needed to support the manufacture of the installations and technologies required, but many of these technologies, storage of nuclear waste, carbon capture, utilization and storage, deep geothermal, for example, which you can see pictured on the slide, involve working deep below the surface of the earth. It really does all start with the rocks. And that means geoscientists are needed everywhere you turn. The materials we need are also changing as technologies develop. Here are the ingredients of a smartphone an electric car and a wind turbine. All of these things are really familiar to us now. But when I first joined the Geological Society in 1981, we didn't even have a fax machine. Telexes were our method of high-tech communication. And I well remember driving to Oxford from my office in Charlbury to collect extremely long telexes that were actually cross sections, geotechnical cross sections from, from coal fields. Then there was the fax machine and around about 1987, we had, a, we had a client who was very keen on fax. And so we got this fax machine. We didn't have to trot up the road to the local business center anymore to pick up our faxes that then faded after a few weeks in the file. So you couldn't read them. And I remember, the partners all stood around the fax machine waiting for our first message from this client who was very keen on fax. And now smartphones are computers in our pockets. And this is a lovely diagram demonstrating the ex exponential growth in the range of earth materials that we use. So there's that lovely little picture of the windmill. And now look in 2000, at all the colored spots, all the different, all the different elements and the huge, um, and the huge slope on the, on the graph. We can see in this rather, rather busy slide that six out of the nine key technologies for energy transition, which are listed here, batteries, fuel cells, motors, wind, 
PV, robotics, drones, 3DP, I'm not quite sure what that is, but no doubt somebody here will tell me, and ICT. Um, they are elements with the highest, so the red supply risk. The report from this slide, from which this slide is taken, indicates that for batteries for electric vehicles and energy storage, we will need up to 18 times more lithium, five times more cobalt in 2030, and almost 60 times more lithium and 15 times more cobalt in 2050, compared to current supply to the whole EU economy. 120 times current EU demand of the rare earth neodym neodymium, difficult to say, sorry, could be required to provide data storage for the global data sphere in 2025. These are quite scary statistics. They're about, they're about change and adaptation. We may, may, we may need less of other things, but what we certainly do need is a lot of, a lot of um, raw material to support these um, uh, key technologies. So what are we going to do? And how do we get these materials that we so desperately need? We have three options. We manage without them, we recycle, or we mine. It's fairly clear that managing without minerals for clean energy is not really a realistic or just option. I've just explained or summarized the, the enormous growth in, in minerals that that we need. And look at, um, look at these statistics, 940 million people, 13% of the world's population do not currently have access to electricity. 40%, 3 billion of the world's population do not have access to clean fuels for cooking. And so is it really a choice to leave it at that? And then there's the rise in world population. Individuals consume more of what they cannot grow in developed countries. And countries all over the world are developing fast. So the first slide is, is showing economic growth. The, the pinker it is, the... Um, the higher growth in GDP per capita in local currency units between 2009 and 2015 in, 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 in percentage. The internet is another interesting metric for development with direct links to raw materials supply. Ooh. What's happened? I pressed the wrong button, I think. Kevin, can you rescue me or somebody? I think I pressed the one saying black. I thought I was pressing the green one. Okay, I'll run up. Sorry. So what about recycling and the circular economy? You can see here a number of representations of the way this could work. Some of these are completely circular. No new inputs and no waste either. Is that actually realistic? Probably not. This is the most realistic representation, I think, in that it recognizes the need for primary resources 
and also the inevitability of some waste at every stage. Of course, we can work to reduce waste to a minimum. We can do better at producing things that can be viably deconstructed and recycled or reused. But we've seen the challenge of increasing demand, whatever we do, increased world population, increased development. And so even if we get extremely good at this, there will always be a need for some primary resources. It all starts with the rock, as we've seen. And so I'm afraid mining will remain an essential part of the picture. Alex, it's not um, moving on. Thank you. Oh. If you can't grow it, you have to mine it. Many of you will have heard that expression before. Even materials that we can recycle originate as rocks or minerals extracted from the earth, unless we can grow them. Mining is unpopular generally with society. It's commonly considered to be a necessary evil, even amongst those who accept that what comes out of the ground is essential, not only to sustaining our ways of life now and in the future, but also to the energy transition that's such a vital element of the actions needed to meet climate change targets. We have a gap between supply and demand. That much I hope is, is obvious and not just for minerals, also in our geoscience workforce needed by the mining industry. Many young people are rightly passionate about addressing the climate crisis, saving the planet, preserving ecosystems, low carbon technologies, recycling, but not so keen on mining. In some universities, they are actively discouraged from exploring this career path discouraged by their peers, I should say, not, not, by, not by the, um, you know, certainly not by departments of geology. The thought is that mining is dirty, damaging, irresponsible, profiteering, something that ought to be stopped. It's so very important that bad practice is called out, that high standards are demanded. But to achieve this, it is vital that there's a pipeline of well-educated and trained people to contribute to doing better in the sector. As you've seen, like it or not, it's here to stay. So to recap so far, the challenge we face is about supply and demand. How do we close the gap? Supply of minerals and workforce. And also the gaps in public perception, the sort of binary views about these big issues of our, of our time, cancellation culture. How do we close these gaps? I'm going to move on to considering how we can do this, do our mining more responsibly and sustainably, and how we can communicate, express and operationalize responsibility and sustainability in mining. ESG is an acro acronym for environment, social, and governance. It's part of the modern vocabulary around the notion of sustainable development, which has been around for decades. The Brundtland Commission defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This statement is both completely relevant to and a significant challenge for mining. This three circle or three pillar representation of, of sustainability may be very familiar to some of you, but note that Elkington, who, who produced this, this particular diagram, was promoting this model as a basis for system change. It was never supposed to be just an accounting system or lead to any sort of trade-off mentality. This is really important 
when we're trying to avoid greenwashing and box ticking, but it is a simple tool and it's easy to remember. And here we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that give us a framework for considering all aspects of development, including mining or mineral, mineral extraction. They also give stakeholders to any policy or project that will affect them a framework for some really clear requests or demands that they might reasonably make if the policies or projects are to be acceptable to them. They were adopted by 193 governments on the 23rd of, 25th of September uh, 2015, and the SDGs outline a plan to end po poverty, combat climate change, and fight injustice and inequality. These are really big ambitions. Um, but this is, this is an inspiring and useful um, set of goals. I, I, th I think they're, they're in the process of being updated, updated now. So what is this acronym of our time, ESG? It's a concept, as I said, that's been around for decades, but it's been called various names from corporate social responsibility to sustainability and now ESG. Environmental, social and governance issues very rarely fall into one bucket. They're reflected here as an intertwined rope to demonstrate the interconnectedness between the disciplines. Governance is viewed as the third strand, as it's a critical driver of performance in the environmental and social space, as well as commercially. I really like this representation, having previously been definitely a three circle sort of a person, because it demonstrates interconnectedness and the need for managing risks holistically. I still like the circles because they intersect and I'm interested in, in the gaps and overlaps. Achieving social acceptance for mining projects, also referred to sometimes as social license to operate, that's a, a virtual license, it's, it's not, a, not a real piece of paper, is about effective avoidance, management and mitigation of ESG risks, ESG related risks. So environmental aspects typically include the topics you can see spread over that slide. Some examples that particularly interface with society include water resources, whether these are surface or groundwater resources, and the associated quantities and qualities, and rehabilitation and closure, which drives the range of viable land uses once mining has ceased. Biodiversity provides a range of benefits for local and more removed communities, a clear illustration of the overlap between environmental and social aspects. I'm talking particularly about, uh, about mining here. Climate change considers not only how a project could contribute to climate change, for example, through its emissions um, of, of transport and processing, but also what changing climate means for the environmental attributes in the project's host environment. The environmental footprint and therefore impacts of a mine changes throughout its operational life. It's really unlike an infrastructure project where you build a building or a railway or a flyover, something that is static. It has its shape, it has its configuration, it has its appearance and unless you change the colour of the paint, that, that remains broadly the same throughout its life. But a mine is a dynamic environment. And I'm particularly talking about, um, well, my experience is mostly in open cast mining. But even when we, even when we hide our mine by, by underground mining, there's, there's often a dynamic and changing environment at the surface because of the... Um, because of the need to store waste rock and process waste above the ground. So we've got this dynamic um, project, which can go on for many tens of years. And we need to look at the environmental impact, impacts throughout its, throughout its life. This is quite a challenge. What this requires is that we pay 
a lot of attention to planning and design to predict how our mine at its various stages of development and after closure will impact the environment and the people. In the social space, impacts are largely related to the proximity of people to a specific activity, the workforce and the communities impacted. You might notice on this slide, health and safety is there. And therefore, in the mine, geotechnics and engineering geology are there, just as an aside. But these health and safety could arguably also be in the environmental bucket, or it could be in governance. Normally, it's put under the social heading because of the potential harm to people. But that just illustrates that there's nothing fixed about these various subjects um, in these in these buckets and remember the intertwined intertwined rope stakeholder engagement is very firmly in the social bucket in the social strand the manner in which this is undertaken often defines the relationship between the company and surrounding stakeholders often as i've said for very many years and many years also before the mine the mine gets underway. Here we've got a clear overlap with governance. How does the company engage with internal stakeholders? How does it engage with external stakeholders? What values does the company project? Does it translate those values right from the boardroom to um, the, the, the mine manager having a cup of tea with a local woman who's concerned about? What, what they're doing. Is the company trustworthy? Geoscientists and specifically exploration geologists are usually the first boots on the ground, often repeatedly and often for many years. They've got a really vital role to play in establishing relationships with local people, in hearing about their needs and concerns, in noticing evidence of ground conditions that might impact on design, or in, in noticing and understanding what landscapes and, um, and buildings and, and sacred places mean to, to local people. And so when I call my lecture, Joining the Dots, these are really important dots to join. The dots between what the developer, what the miner um, seeks to do and gaining, gaining the, the, the trust and understanding the, the social environment in which that can be done. Governance considerations determine the DNA of the company. Usually it's policies and performance in relation to environmental and social aspects. It's the framework within which risk management happens. It's the underpinning of culture, which determine, determines whether risk and operational areas are silos or interconnected, whether the boardroom influences the way the com company projects itself through individuals working at the rock face, as it were. How a mining company is governed, or any company is governed, come to that, and the manner in which it conducts its business directly relates to the confidence that investors will have in the ability of that company to be good caretakers of their investment. Internal, internal company controls, ethics and compliance status, including in respect of environmental and social aspects, alongside all, all its other risk dry, risks, drives the reputation of the company as a good neighbour and a worthy investment. EY regularly prepares a report detail, detailing the top risks facing the mining industry. Many of these are directly or indirectly related to topics typically falling within the ESG banner. It's notable that license to operate remained in the top spot in 2019 and 2020. That's what these, the, the, these are examples from 19, 2019 and 2020. Interestingly, this risk shot up from number seven in 2018 to take the top spot. 
A new risk relating to the need to reduce a mine's carbon footprint also arrived in 2020. And this is certainly a significant and growing focus in the industry. I'm going to move on now to consider what sustainability responsible extraction looks like in practice. I'm going to start with an example of an ESG failure leading to a loss of investor confidence and massive re reputational damage for the company involved and the mining industry more widely. You may have seen these images in your newspapers on the 24th of August 2020. These were on the web, these were on the BBC website, in fact, with the caption, you can gorge cave site before and after mining works. In fact, the bottom picture was after stripping and drilling and charging of the blast holes, but before the blast that destroyed ancient rock sheltered shelters. It represents the point of no return in the destruction of a site with evidence of human habitation 46,000 years ago. To put that in context, pyramids were 4,500 years ago, Stonehenge 5,200, Machu Picchu 600, Great Wall of China 2,250. First human settlement at Uluru, Australia 10,000 years ago. It's a bit like the highway authority deciding to put a massive road cutting through Stonehenge overnight without telling everybody they were going to do it. It appears that the mining company knew about the caves. They'd invested a lot of money in archeological studies and in stakeholder engagement with those to whom the site is sacred. But somehow these efforts were dislocated from work on the ground. The drillers and the shot firers and the pit superintendent who planned and authorized overburden stripping were not aware of any of that and went ahead with the blast in accordance with the mine plan. This reputational, cultural and social performance disaster came about, I think, through a failure of governance, a lack of effective communication and joined up thinking in particular. The company has an international reputation for innovation and research, has committed to a list of ESG standards and accords as long as your arm, and employs thousands of really excellent people all over the world. These individuals care very deeply about doing the right thing. They were rightly very, very upset about what happened. This was clearly a wake up call for them and given the reaction of investors and commentators for the whole sector. Investors and shareholders are demanding more from companies than simple legal compliance. They have significant influence over companies with whom they've entrusted their money. So that's an example of how things go wrong, not through technical mistakes or bad intent, but because the governance system fails. I think this is a fantastic infographic. It was created during uh, an online conference in 2021, uh, the second of annual responsible raw materials conferences called ESG Toolbox for Responsible Sourcing. Here we see the huge range of issues that need to be taken into account in considering responsible sourcing of mineral raw materials. Metals and other minerals can only be mined where they naturally occur. And so the mining life cycle inevitably starts with the rocks. And that means geologists have a crucial role to play. Without geologists, we can't move. We can't move forward at all. But even a cursory glance at this infographic will be enough to persuade you that the supply chain for mineral raw materials is incredibly complicated and involves a huge range of areas of expertise and therefore a huge range of people and organizations that somehow needs to be joined up. My technical experience as an open pit designer sits in this region. And in the next part of my lecture, I'm going to focus on this part of the mining life cycle predominantly and the strategies that we use to ensure responsibility in mining and quarrying. This classification system underpins standards for reporting in the Crisco family of codes and standards, which are required to be used by mining companies listed on all major international stock exchanges when they make public reports on their mineral resources and reserves. As you'll see, 
with the colored blue and red arrows. The classification system has a geological aspect. That's the blue arrow. Investigations and modeling that increase geological confidence in the deposit under consideration. And also many non-geological aspects collectively called modifying factors, which determine how much of the deposit can be economically, practically, and safely extracted without unacceptable environmental and social impacts. Reports are prepared on exploration results and mineral deposits in accordance with this classification. And their purpose is to inform investors or potential investors and their advisors using common vocabulary and terminology, this classification in particular, so that they can understand the risks associated with given projects, can compare alternative invest investment opportunities with comparable risk, and therefore decide when, where to invest. The mining companies prepare the reports for investors, but a, a, a large part of this reporting is, um, is the responsibility of competent or qualified persons, and they are defined in the codes and standards. The main principles governing the operation and application of the standard and the, and the resultant preparation of public reports are, as you see here, transparency, materiality, competence, and impartiality. Transparency requires that the reader of a public report is provided with sufficient information, the presentation of which is clear and unambiguous. Materiality requires that it contains all the relevant information at the date of disclosure, which investors and pro their professional advisors would reasonably require. Now, this is all in the opinion of the competent person. This person is really important. They have particular qualifications, they have um, relevant experience, they have to have particular um, uh, uh, length, uh, yes, re relevant experience and, and um, particular, they, they need to belong to um, uh, a professional um, organization that, that has a, 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 code of, a code of conduct, an enforceable code of conduct. Um, but they take personal, personal responsibility, a bit like an expert witness in a, in a court. Competence requires that the public report is based on work that's the responsibility of these competent persons, suitably qualified and experienced persons. And impartiality requires that the author of the public report is satisfied and able to state without any qualifications that their work has not been unduly influenced by the organization, company, or person commissioning that report. And that all their doc assumptions are documented. So just to return for a moment to the classification diagram. The vertical axis, axis is the responsibility of geologists with appropriate experience and professional credentials in modeling and understanding the mineral deposit. The work may involve many people and take place over many years as more information is collected and confidence builds in, estimate, in estimates of the quality, quantity and disposition of minerals in the ground. Along the bottom of the diagram, we see that many, that, that many appropriate qualified professionals are involved in considering and optimizing the modifying factors. And now you see the diagram overlain by the standard definitions of mineral resources and mineral reserves. What I want to point out here is to classify a mineral resource. So that's, we've got good confidence, the minerals in the ground, we've got ranging from okay confidence to high confidence, um, from top, top to bottom. In order for us to define that as a mineral resource in this system, we have to be sure that there are reasonable prospects for eventual economic recovery. eventual economic extraction, in fact, the words are. So we need to look at these non-geological considerations in the pink box from right at the right at the very beginning. Consideration of these modifying factors 
takes place, should take place throughout the project's life cycle. Initially, it's only common sense to narrow down options and support go or no-go decisions. Later, the consideration of modifying factors becomes more and more detailed to underpin questions of feasibility and operational design, but their relevance in the level of detail at each stage does change and evolve. I've added green ticks next to geology, engineering and finance. This is where most traditional competent person technical expertise lies. But things are changing. I've also added lines for ESG, increasingly accepted as essential in minerals reporting to provide investors with explicit information on ESG risks. You saw those press clippings after the UCAN gorge disaster. These lines give an insight to some, by no means all, of the aspects that need to be considered as you progress through the mining life cycle. Note that positive leg legacy and everything that comes with closure needs to be considered before you've even touched the ground. It is very old fashioned and extremely bad practice these days to start digging and think, well, it's gonna be 50 years before we get to the end. We'll sort that out later. That's not the way things should be done. But we're talking about long time scales. So there, you know, there are still mines which, which will have been started with, with that sort of mindset. In my world of, of quarrying, we're talking much shorter time scales, generally speaking. And always throughout my, my, my um, professional career as a, as a quarry designer, you know, always start at the end. What's it going to be like at the end? And then we figure out how we're going to, how we're going to get there. Just because these risks tend to be realised only at the end of the mine's life, it doesn't mean to say it's not important at the beginning. And it also doesn't mean to say that it's nothing to do with an exploration or resource geologist. It's very easy for any of us, whatever we are, whether we're medics, geologists, physicists, to be very comfortable with our, with our specialist subject areas. Exploration resource geologists, as I've said, can spend years and years working, working on a deposit. But if there's any, any prospect that it's going to turn into a mine, they need to just look out of their silo at what's happening with the, with the modifying factors. The Geological Society is a participating organization of the Pan-European Reserves and Resources Reporting Committee. PERC for short. And I'm very proud to say that PERC was the first of the Crisco family of standards and codes to provide extensive guidance and requirements for the reporting of ESG risks. We published the latest standard, including a lot of guidance um, and requirements in 2021. The key point in this slide is that during the mining life cycle, I'm, I'm talking probably about um, metal mining, you know, big mining here. There are ownership change points, they're, they're the red dollar signs, where value may be influenced by incomplete assent, uh, assessment because assumptions get built in and risks and modifying factors get forgotten. As you go through the mining life cycle, the amounts of money already invested and the amounts of money that need to be invested increase. Pressure to succeed builds. If we report more fully, that's less likely to happen. Those important project transitions also represent opportunities to avoid problems um, of, of, of perpetuating unrealistic assumptions and build a project trajectory that builds value and minimizes downside risk. So you'll see on, this is almost identical to the previous slide, but now ESG is colored in green on all of the, all of the little um, three circle diagrams. Geology is fundamental, but 
reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction, including demonstration of responsibility, is a key consideration for investors. The most significant impact of holistic consideration of all relevant factors, including and particularly ESG, is at the start where the options are many. The danger is that we can make assumptions at the early stage, which we find it difficult to challenge later, and therefore miss opportunities that may bite us later. I'm going to say that again. We may find it difficult to challenge later. That is what being human is often all about. So part of good governance is ensuring challenge and, and iteration. So there are some important consequences of failing to consider modifying factors early enough. Missed early opportunities to identify and design out non-geological risks. Missed opportunities to collect baseline data, especially environmental, geotechnical, social, hydrogeological data. Missed opportunities to engage with the public and establish trust, collaboration and two-way communication. Increased risk of unforeseen but not unforeseeable physical, environmental and reputational disasters. Disconnect between corporate and site level. So we have the greatest ability and opportunity to mitigate risk at the lowest costs early in the project life cycle. This chart is well sensitized and understood within mining, particularly in the project space. As time progresses, our ability to change plans or mitigate risks decreases significantly. That's the green line. And the cost of doing so increases. That's the black line. The potential impact of the risk increases as well as we near execution and project completion. This is just a simple visualization of what we're aiming to achieve at a site specific level in open pit design. And it's, it's, it's my diagram. Um, it's the way I conceive of, of quarry design. The dashed lines around the key outcomes represents permeable disciplinary boundaries and the need for all the various disciplines to work together in a holistic collaborative way and achieve a quarry design that has achieved all of the objectives, taking account of all of the interactions. It's a bit easier in quarrying because the time scale is more, more compressed. The double-headed arrows signify the iteration and checking back that's needed. I'm going to use this example, which is loosely based on a real scenario, where the holistic process described previously didn't really unfold as expected by the company that acquired this site. The company acquired a site which had been evaluated by a geologist to contain a deposit of limestone, and it was classified as a measured resource. That is having high geological confidence and reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. The price was based on the quantity of stone the geologist had estimated. This was for crushed rock aggregate. The planning authority was encourage, encouraging about the prospects for gaining planning permission, and the company appoints a team of consultants to prepare a planning application and environmental statement. They hold a public exhibition to let the public know what they're proposing in broad outline. They produce some lovely plans and cross sections like this. The discipline, well, not quite like this. The disciplines represented in the consultant team include engineering geology, open pit design, a full range of environmental specialisms and planning. The site is a long narrow one aligned north south and this cross section is a representative slice, vertical slice, east west through it. It soon became apparent to the engineering geologists who very early on felt that they were a little bit like the little boy in the Emperor's New Clothes story, and to the quarry designers, that the steep inclination of the strata on the eastern side, the right-hand side on this diagram, gave rise to a geotechnical setting that in combination with the steep eastern face would lead to significant risk of the face falling, failing along one of the bedding planes i.e. the rocks sliding into the pit. 
you can see that the originally proposed face, the red, right there, yes, the red line there, um, would have undercut the beds of rocks. If you imagine a, a pile of books, if you tilt them up and you don't put a, 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 a bookshelf against the, a bookstop against the end, they'll just slide out. This had not been appreciated by the person who wrote the resources report. Such a slope failure would obviously be dangerous to personnel working in the pit and hence contrary to the quarry's regulations. Um, and obviously immoral and could potentially close the pit entirely if it disrupted haulage routes and blocked working faces. It would have been impossibly expensive to stabilize the faces using rock bolts and the only viable option was to flatten the eastern face so as to eliminate undercutting of the bedding surfaces which led to the unsafe technical setting. The client had a brilliant idea, decided perhaps we could move the eastern excavation limit to the, to the east and divert the stream, but um, this, was, this was clearly not acceptable because of the ecological, or apparently not acceptable because of the ecological importance of the stream. And so the only option was to maintain the position of the Eastern excavation limit and lose a significant proportion of the volume believed to be available, more than 50%. The geologist who wrote that report didn't appreciate the serious safety implications of the adverse geotechnical setting or the impact of remedial measures on the viability of the project. No conversation took place at resource estimation stage with a geotechnical specialist or mining engineer. Neither did the client or the geologist read or understand the ecological report commissioned by them at the time of the assessment. On top of the problems with the east wall de design, it emerges that the amount of space allowed between the western site boundary and the pit limit for the storage of waste rock, the yellow stuff, is insufficient to accommodate the volumes that will arise in a that will arise in a tip that will have stable slopes and account for bulkage of the material. The quarry design team suggests that the problem can be solved by buying more land outside the site boundary, but this is ruled out by the planning and social engagement specialists. The neighbour is the chair of the local action group has his own development aspirations which would be adversely impacted by the quarry next door and he was never contacted during the site investigation. The only available resource left after this further modification is probably a third of what was assessed as being available and upon which the sale proceeded. This is a slightly exaggerated version of a real situation that arose at a similar site. It was in the mid 1980s, but it does illustrate where failure to consider the modifying factors early in the mining life cycle can get you. Imagine that in a multi million pound, multi million dollar, I don't know, copper mine. This Diagram illustrates a tried and tested approach to quarry design that seeks to avoid the nasty surprises that I've described. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it because I see it's, it's already five to six and I've got a few more things to, to talk about. But what I want to just draw your attention to is the fact that there's one single headed arrow on this drawing and it's here. And it's before resources. Remember resources, we can't declare a resource unless there are reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. There's lots of work goes on in here, deciding whether there's a project there or not. What are the options? Looking at the key constraints, looking at the, the key criteria. Everywhere else on this diagram, and quite deliberately, they are double-headed arrows, implying communication, iteration, joined up thinking, joining the dots. So here's our recurrent question, or the set of recurrent questions. The unforeseen but not unforeseeable problems that arose in the example and in many other examples that I could tell you if, if, um, if I were to 
break confidentiality could have been avoided if assumptions had been questioned at the earliest possible stage and certainly before investing in the site. I'm going to scoop over those because I want to talk a bit about um, stakeholders and, um, and communication. This, um, this worksheet here is a, is a summary by um, Satala Limited of how to map your stakeholders as part of enterprise risk man management training. I, I'm, I'm indebted to Satala for permission to share this. And as an aside, I can personally recommend Satala training in enterprise risk management. There's a hint at the bottom. This is a great hint. It's simple and to the point. When determining your management strategy for your stakeholders, make sure you view the world from their perspective. But I want to focus here on how we figure out what these perspectives are. As you see, there are some key influences that make this quite difficult. Making assumptions and acting on our preconceived ideas will always be wrong. It's always wrong in a in our, you can all, all think of times when we've assumed that somebody thinks something and actually wasn't what they thought at all. There are some key influences that make this very difficult. Making assumptions and acting, oh, I've already said that. Somehow we need to find out what are their, um, what are their attitudes? What are their opinions? The best way to do this must surely be to ask them. But it turns out that this is also very difficult. Asking people what they want, what they think of our project. We've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of care. We're really committed to our project. It feels quite dangerous to ask people what they think of it. They might not like it. This is a framework for mapping and creating communication and consulting strategies with each group of stakeholders and, it, as, and, and stakeholders and introducing the concept of trust. Where there's a high degree of trust and acceptance, stakeholders tend to fall in the bottom left, low interest, lower influence. And these are likely to be more supportive of our project, less engaged stakeholders, um, more supportive, but less engaged. But if things happen that suddenly change this, they may soon withdraw that informed consent. An example of this from my experience was a community living in a historic mining area, close to a metal mine that had been dormant for many years. A foreign investor acquired the site and obtained all necessary permits to recommence metal mining. Local communities were very supportive. They welcomed the jobs and community benefits that would be created. There was no action group, no hostile public meetings. But the mining company made mistakes in their community engagement, most notably stating that test blasts had demonstrate, demonstrated that blast vibrations would be imperceptible in the villages close to the mine. The blasts were not imperceptible. And when efforts to mitigate the impacts failed, the company fell back on, well, you'll just have to put up with it because the monitoring shows that we're operating within our permitted limits. Then there was an action group and plenty of hostile public meetings. Low level of trust and acceptance in a project or proposal leads to a likelihood of more hostility and more engagement. But stakeholders can't be pigeonholed, pigeonholed for all time. You saw in my example how they, how they changed that. There was a discussion panel in the 2022 Responsible Raw Materials Conference. And I was really struck when our participant identified her top pick for making ESG a reality as the creation of a culture where stakeholders no longer believe that, be that they belong only to one category. You might think that because we are all in fact stakeholders in whatever we're involved in, in more than one category at any one time, this would make it easier for us to understand the perspectives of other stakeholders. But my experience tells me that this is not actually true. We find it really quite difficult to, to unravel all of this. 
Many of you will recognize what's happening in my cartoon here. This is a snapshot of a very familiar scenario. Here are two people or groups of people locked in debate mode over say a permit application for a new open pit mine. They're both human beings, both presumably citizens, consumers, perhaps employees, members of families and other communities, but they are representing two stakeholder groups. Each party brings forward their best arguments. They do their research and evidence is pitted against emotion. They recruit others to side with them. Lawyers and consultants make lots of money making their cases for them. They create and exploit, exploit power imbalances. Everything escalates. Everybody is stressed. Everybody is upset. It's too difficult for anyone to concede. There's no possibility for common ground. They simply don't speak the same language. They get nowhere. And so they try to convince independent decision makers in this example, typically a planning inspector or judge or arbitrator by force of their argument. The decision maker decides between the two points of view. Someone loses, someone wins. You're not listening. I've already told you that. You are being unreasonable are the sorts of phrases we use. But what is really going on? What's stopping these people hearing what the other has to say? All of the thoughts in the blue bubbles are versions of, I am not feeling heard, and so I feel powerless. This cartoon indicates how mediation based on the principles of nonviolent communication can help the parties create a respectful connection that can provide the conditions in which they can co-create strategies that will resolve the dispute to both sides' satisfaction. This is not about compromise, but about building trust and reaching an outcome based, based on consent. Most approaches at resolution seek compromise, which means usually that everybody gives something up and nobody is really very satisfied. The mediator or facilitator helps to translate the language of judgment and blame and the manifestation of power imbalances into language that builds trust, empathy and openness. The change that is facilitated is that each party feels heard and aims to understand, even if not to agree with, the other party's point of view. When we create those conditions, then we can have a discussion. In my example of a mediator working with stakeholders with opposing and conflicting views, the mediator's role is not so much to resolve the dispute, but rather to help the parties to create the conditions in which they can find a way to resolve it. You can see on the right hand side a range of skills and roles for a mediator or facilitator working in this way. And training and education is, is key to creating systems in which this way of communication is embedded. Resolving conflicts with the help of a trained facilitator is one thing, but truly creating a system that seeks connection, accountability and understanding and allows for challenge in a safe and constructive way is quite another. I'd really recommend training um, in, in, in mediation, in, in this way of looking at the world to anyone. They are far and away the most valuable tools. My, my mediation training has given me far and away the most valuable tools in my toolbox as a geologist, as a line manager, as a chair, as a leader, a collaborator. They don't detract from my scientific edu education, my training and my experience. Rather, they help me deploy all of these things more effectively. The need for culture change, top-down clarity of purpose and vision and accountability to achieve objectives of responsible raw material supply and avoid the risks created by specialists working in silos are, I hope, evident from earlier in my lecture. In conclusion, I, I hope I've persuaded you of the continued need for mining, but also of the complexity and challenge around scaling up mineral supply responsibly. For me, the key challenge is achieving more connection and collaboration in joining the dots. It starts with the rocks, but delivery is all about the people. The way they communicate, collaborate, innovate and organize. And I've got a few acknowledgements there and some further reading I'd like to offer you. And um, that concludes my lecture. Thank you very much.
Thank you. That was wonderful. Very interesting indeed. Um, do we have any any questions from uh, anyone uh, either yeah. either here or um, or online? Um, Sorry, Ruth, it was inevitable I was going to ask you a question. I hope um, it's not a hard one. No. Um, so, we're, we're, so John Davis, my name, of Geotechnical Consulting Group. I'm an engineering geologist as well. But Ruth and I uh, probably operate as engineering geologists in, in very different fields. I'm mostly about built environment. So in the last couple of years, or possibly a little bit longer, there's been quite a few very important publications. This is touching on your your known unknowns, unknown unknowns point. Uh, uh, so there's publications are effectively around ground models and different sorts of ground models. So we have the uh, IAEG C25 Commission on Engineering Ground Models. And subsequently, um, recently, there have been a, a couple of publications, global publications around how ground models effectively can be used in contracts, one of which is I was closely involved in. So my question is, are those concepts, the, the sort of the ground model, the conceptual ground model, the observational ground model, and a design ground model, are they are they used in your area of expertise in, in pit design? Um, if they're not, do you see benefit in doing that? Well, it's not a hard question. I say, I'd say um, we don't refer to ground models in those terms, but it's it's all about ground models. It's, it's about identifying geotechnical settings, environmental settings, um, optimizing, optimizing the way, um, you know, we're changing the ground model all the time. Um, so, so the concepts are the same, but it's, it's, not, it's not codified quite in, in that way. The PERC um, standard and all, all the Crisco codes and standards, actually the whole family of codes and standards that are used all over the world, um they're they're really based on um risk assessment figuring out how confident we are um in 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 in, in what we say now i i can it, it, it this is a very different different way of looking at things um in in metal mining we need to know that there's enough ore in a particular concentrate, you know, there's a high enough concentration of ore in the deposit um, ex ex that's extensive enough for us to to um, uh, to go for it. In in cement raw materials, it's an entirely different. You know, have we got the right chemistry? Can we release it at the at the right at the right rate? So. Um, I, th I think what I'm saying is it's 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 not as codified as that. We we have one we have one from online. I'm going to read it out from an Anastasia. It says, "What can you say about reconciling mining with agriculture in developing countries? Considering companies can take advantage of weaker regulations there, are strict regulations the utmost necessity for sustainable development going forward?" I'd say yes. I mean, there's a world of opportunity there for for for, for big mining, um, you know, really really huge projects where there are um, no other similar projects and haven't been in a, in a particular country. There are fantastic opportunities for creating fit for purpose regulation. Um, there is no reason at all why if we if we're paying proper attention to um, environmental and social issues right at the very beginning of our mind planning we can't we can't build in progressive progressive restoration progressive and um, you know, translocation of of important habitats and so on building in um, what's needed not not digging up precious land and 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 um, um, 
yeah, we, we basically we're creating new land. This is a temporary use of land, even if it's if it, even if it's for many years. So I think regulation is incredibly important, but in and of itself, it's not that useful unless it's um, unless it's enacted and used and and enforced within um, workable governance systems. I'm sorry, Anastasia, that probably wasn't a, a very um, coherent answer. Um, do I need the mic or? I think you're talking about what happened. Okay. Uh, a North American is no. <laughs> the people um, on the online might not be able to hear you. Oh, so, okay, so fair. Um, so my question goes to kind of the heart of joining the dots, but also sometimes when maybe joining the dots is not possible. So say there's E factors that are in direct conflict with the S factors. And how do you overcome that? I, I mean, the one example that comes to mind for me, it, mind, I should say, is, um, you know, we're not living in a world where most of the lithium is found in Norway. You know, it's maybe in less favorable conditions. So how do you overcome those concerns where it could lead to perfection getting in the way of the good and then it just prevents any sort of energy transition yeah interesting question um i think what i'd say is is that it's 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 really clear and everybody can understand that minerals can only be worked where they naturally occur but there are some situations that's not the same as saying, that's not the same as saying, everywhere we find minerals, we have a right to exploit them. And so I think when one takes, takes a holistic view, um, there will be some circumstances where you say, well, okay, there's a lot of lithium there, but at what cost? And I think that's the question. At what cost? What is acceptable? What can we achieve consent for? Um, yeah, I, th I think I think I'd want always to have this this idea of consent in mind because it because it implies that everybody's views have been considered, even if in the end um, it's a less perfect outcome for some. That there will be some some projects. That, that could never happen. For example, um, a cement factory at Stonehenge or, um, you know, this, if you think of the seven wonders of the world, no, nobody would imagine, you know, the, the, a, a, a lithium project um, in Babylon or the pyramids. You just, you just wouldn't do it, would you? And those are extreme examples. So it's, it's, it's finding, you know, what's what's equitable what's 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 reasonable um it's not easy it's really not easy but all the time we take this binary i'm against that i'm for that type of attitude we're, we're not teasing out you know what's what's for the common good um and what is beyond the pale Uh, my name is Rodney Bridle. Uh, I, I'm interested in uh, perhaps the ESG aspects of what if there aren't, there isn't 60 times the amount of lithium that we need for the future. Uh, if, if that isn't available on the planet, do you have a responsibility to, to say we better change our mind and try and develop other types of batteries? Well, I think that question is rather above my pay grade, but um, that's the reality. And it's, it, it, again, it's, it's about connectedness, isn't it? Because all of these announcements and aspirations need to be backed up with some sort of, you know, well, what can we do? And, and what, what, it, what is the reality? And we need to constantly be checking back, you know, what's, what can we reasonably do? We 
more pain. I, I'm interested in the word more. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a lithium explorer. I'm just a, a humble quarry designer. That's one at the back there. Um, this is like a more short or practical question, but you know the mine case study that you said was loosely based upon a case study in 1980. Did it end up failing or did it somehow, despite all the risks? Well, it wasn't quite as bad as that. Um, the, the company that bought this quarry did operate it. Um, to be honest, I don't know whether, whether it's... Um, whether it succeeded, I, it, you know, it was, it was a fairly, fairly small operation. But I'm, I, I'd lay a small bet that they lost, they lost money on it. Thank you. It's a great question, though. I must go there and and see what it looks like now. There's one here. Steps up to here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think I may have missed the conversation with our American friend, but um, how far internationally are these ESG ideas uh, going? Um, I'm thinking in 1980, I and two colleagues were invited to China to go to the rare earth mine in Inner Mongolia. And in 1980, the main question the Chinese had to us before all the development of internet was how quickly should we develop this resource? The resource is two kilometers long. Mm. They never bothered to drill more than 50 meters down. And then it was said to have 90% of the world's rare earth in it. Well, now probably that number is down. But that is still the main problem for the Chinese is at what level of production do they extract these rare earth minerals. If they do it too quickly, then their value goes, goes down. And if they keep it restricted, it's going to affect the rest of the economy. So I don't quite see how ESG is affecting the Chinese in any way. No, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, because, uh, but, so we've got geopolitics on, on the one hand, but where, where there is traction, with these ideas of ESG and responsibility in 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 um, the the uh, supply of of raw materials, is in the investment community, because without investment, I think China might be a special case here, but without investment, mining projects don't get off the ground at all, and increasingly investors are insisting on and there are all kinds of schemes and metrics to um uh for, for mining companies to demonstrate their their ESG credentials to investors and we you know we're talking big money so that's that's what drives the international mining industry but then as you say there there are there's there's the geopolitical aspect of of um supply and demand um so there's movement forward but I, you know, I don't pretend to have the answer. I'm afraid. <laughs> I, do, I, I wouldn't like it to be a, you know, it's quite scary. But I don't think it's a council of despair. I think human beings are incredibly resourceful and adaptable. Um, but we really need to get on with figuring things out. And, more questions online okay yep. well uh thank you ruth i think we all enjoyed that um quick round of applause and <laughs>